I'm using a mic stand today, and nobody else can use my mic stand. I'm going to clean it up afterwards. But um, I am intimidated by any time we do a Mother's Day type thing. Is that fair? I think that um, it just is for a, a guy to, to speak about moms is just not right. Amen? Because uh, my wife tells me all the time I don't know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's always... Uh, uh, a tough thing, you know, because you, you, when you, I even said it this way, I, I want to celebrate the moms, um, and, and I want them to know that they have value, and probably the, the worst job in all the world, maybe the best job as well, but they, uh, it's probably the, the most thankless job is, is a mom, and, and the things that they do that nobody else sees other than just them and God, to, to see, but how grateful we are for them. Now, um, y'all know that I've been going through this little uh, thing in Genesis, so um, I want to take. I want you to take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter four. You should have seen Mark's face this week when I said I'm going to be talking about Eve, the first mom. He's like, "Well, that I don't think I've ever heard that on Mother's Day." And I thought, "Well." Um, she was the beginning of it all. Now, I've always heard the joke that there's going to be this long line in heaven of all these women going one by one and slapping Eve when they come up and see her. But that's not the way that it's going to be. What you're going to do when you see Eve, you're going to, you're going to go up there and hug her neck, and you're going to say, I can't believe you started all this. But how grateful, how grateful in God's will. This is um, uh, a thing that uh, when, we, when we talk about moms, I think they get a little bit of a bad rap. In, in certain respects, and I think that they feel secondary, and they shouldn't. Now, I understand Ephesians 5, 23 says that the man is the head of the house, but Adrian Rogers, one of my all-time favorites, said, well, according to Scripture, it was because Adam was first, so man may be given that responsibility of being in the head of the house, and that's true. And that's their responsibility that they're going to stand before God one day and answer for how they were the head to lead the home. But he also said if, if, if the man is the head of the home, many times they're the bonehead of the home. Can I get an amen? But he said the woman is the heart of the home. And we should get an amen for that too. Because the, the, the man is so uh, in tune with God, how God created him to provide, to work, to uh, protect uh, the home, to, to make sure that he is the line of defense against everything that comes against the home. But the woman has a, a different role. She's the heart of, of the, the home. And let me just say, she shared in being created in the image of God. Don't get this that Adam was created in the image of God and, and Eve was created in the image of Adam. Not at all. She came from Adam, but God even did that just so that they would know that, that as he would say later on in uh, Genesis 2, that the, uh, they should leave their parents, and that's a forecast of what would come later on, but they should become one flesh. They would be identified as one. The family is the first institution that God created. It's the first and most important institution that God created. Now you can go on to say, well, in the New Testament, God sent His Spirit and He created the church. Well, amen. Hallelujah for that. We, the church is the body of Christ. Those brought together by the same, in, same common Spirit given to us, Jesus, Holy Spirit, given to us, the, the third part of the Trinity. But, but he gave Adam and Eve together. He put them together because they needed that. He said that um, in, in chapter 2 that Adam was incomplete without Eve. And he made him a helpmate. See, I think that he made her a helpmate too. A life partner. I was 25 uh, when Lynn and I got married and did a lot of dating before that. 
And, you know, when you're dating, you know, you're always kind of a, you're not just going out with some girl. I mean, you're thinking, hey, she's cute, you know. Hey, I like her personality. I think, and, and kind of, you're, Chuck, you're making them check off all the boxes, you know. Can she make biscuits, you know, baby? All those things. Are, and uh, when Lynn filled out the application, she put down, no, I'm just kidding. But there's something that's empty in you that when you are lucky enough to find that one, that it enhances everything that you do. It adds to where you're empty, but even where you think that you have something uh, of blessing from God, it enhances, it makes it explode even more. Uh, more wonderful, more joyous, more peaceful. Uh, so much that is there. Now, that is a both and. Adam was the beneficiary of that, but Eve was the beneficiary in that too. Separate, different, but hear this, may it never be said anything else but equal. Eve was not to walk ahead of Adam. And there are many women who try to do that in this world, and that's out of kilter. But man is not supposed to walk ahead of the wife. And when that happens, and often that happens as well, it's out of kilter. But if you can find two people who honor and respect and love, which means less of you and more of the other. Come on now. Less of you and amplify and build up the other. When you've got two people adding to a relationship like that, you've got something special. You've got something special. Now, the writer of Proverbs says, when that's out of kilter, it's better to live on the corner of a rooftop. Come on, right? And I'll even say that with husband or wife. It says when the wife's being that way. Um, that's why God gave me a couch in the living room, you know, when Lynn sends me out on the couch. But, but I don't have the corner of the roof. I'd fall off. But we, we, don't y'all act so pious that y'all hadn't been there, right? But, but how blessed it is when it's right, when it's good, when the woman can bring the spiritual things of who she is to that relationship, to nurture. To nurture. And to be vulnerable. I, I'm, I wrote notes in this because I'm so paranoid about preaching something like this. Um, men, we, we don't like to be vulnerable. But women, for the most part, are more open to be vulnerable. And when she is adding to the family and he is allowing her to add to the family, there is so much more peace in the home, in the family. Now, why did I pick this particular scripture? Well, I hope to think that God was leading me to pick this. And when I was studying this, and, and I just looked at it, I thought, there's some things that women face today that we don't talk about very much. A lot of times when we're celebrating mothers and we're celebrating women, we go to the Proverbs 31 women and praise God for the Proverbs 31 women. Y'all know what I'm talking about, that virtuous woman. And, and we'll look at uh, some other woman in the Bible, and there are so many wonderful, great examples of the strong woman who did so very much. But in this particular case, I looked at Eve because... Somehow, men, we judge ourselves by how strong we are, how protecting we are, how great of a provider we are. And, and women judge themselves as if they are defined by the family, by how the kids act and how they turn out. And sometimes judge themselves unrighteously when things are... Can I just say the word human? And things don't always go well. And I mean, John, I mean, Luke 15, Jesus gave us the example of the prodigal. And it talks about the, the father. And it talks about the two boys. And how one of those boys was a prodigal and the other one was stubborn, mule headed. But yet, it never mentions the mom. And I think one of the reasons why it probably doesn't mention the mom is because she would have been in the corner blaming herself 
for one son being so stubborn and the other one being so radical. Unrightly so. Because children make up those examples. And they choose to follow, find those when they're young. And we praise God for Scripture. It says, uh, raise up a child in the way he should go. And what? When he is old, he will not depart from it. You put the foundation in, and God will take care of it along the way. So if you have a copy of God's Word, if not, look up on the screen. Stand with me, and we're going to read some verses from Genesis chapter 4. And Adam knew Eve, knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Abel was a keeper of sheep. Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of the flock of the fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance falling? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you. The desire of sin is to conquer you, but you should rule over it. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. That's a very leading statement right there. Cain talked to his brother. But sin was in his heart. Mischief was in his heart. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you, uh, in the next few moments, use your word, the stories that you put in there, not just so that we could learn a story of people long ago, but so we could see the truths that are there. And Father, that you could apply your truths to our lives, so Lord, that we could be the better for it. Meet us here, O oh God, and sir, we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I think it's very interesting in the very first family, in the very first family, there's a broken relationship with Cain. Now, we do not know how old he was when this occurred. People ask me questions about the time frame of how long people lived and all that. That's another subject for another day. I simply am telling you, I don't know how long he was, how old he was. I don't know how, uh, they, how long they had been together. But there was probably some interactions of some things that have been happening along the way. There was no book that God gave them that said, this is how you're supposed to parent. We have a book now that teaches us those things. All they had was the relationship with God. And by the way, that's the best thing, is just walking with God in that relationship with God, praying to God, talking to God about the situations, asking, Lord, I, I don't know what to do here. Lord, I, this is my son, and, and you gave him to me, but Lord, I give him back to you. But probably things were not always right and well. Probably things started to, to move, and it, didn't, it just didn't happen one day. But we see that it was a time of um, an offering. And in this offering, Cain came and, bring, bring, came and brought excuse me, an offering of, of the toll of his hand. See, Cain was like his dad. In Genesis 3, the curse that came after they sinned, and it told Cain very, I mean, excuse me, Adam, very flat out, you're going to have to work by the sweat of your brow. I mean, thorns and thistles, you're going to have to go through all of these things. You're going to have to, to work and provide the ground. And Cain fell into the family business. I don't know how many days Cain went outside and, and worked beside his father, Adam. And they, they took off after the soil 
But now there's the curse upon it. Before the Garden of Eden, there weren't weeds and all that other stuff. They just got to go out, and, and everything was already there. They just got to gather. Now they've got to work for it. So Adam probably had a very good relationship, a working relationship uh, it, with his son Cain. We think of Cain, and the first thing that pops in our mind is all the worst attributes of him. But it probably didn't start that way. So Cain, out of who he is, brings an offering to God to show God, this is what I have done. Abel took a different path. He was a shepherd. Before the fall, in the Garden of Eden, all the animals got along. All the animals were, were perfectly united together. They didn't eat each other. They ate just the grass. But now, the curse is here. The sin is there. And now there are some animals that in their new nature will hunt and kill and eat. So now there is a, another aspect of providing and protecting. And Abel takes that up, and he is a shepherd, and he is providing for that. I wonder if there were some interpersonal relationships where Cain probably thought he was better than the other. And, and, and Abel probably thought, well, you're just doing that because Dad did that, but, but this is what I'm doing. You see, those things, have y'all ever, any of y'all parents ever had a problem between the firstborn and the secondborn? I am told that they're absolute opposites. Uh, in my house, they're opposites, absolute opposites. In, in my, me and my siblings, I'm the baby of the family. I'm the one when they ran out of time and patience, they had me, right? But my oldest brother and my second brother, you could not get more opposite than those two. You could not get. That often happens. It often is simply the way of it. But somewhere in there, they brought of who they were. Cain brought the offering of, of the labor of his hands. Abel brought a sheep, a blood offering. God accepted one. God didn't accept the other. And we'll go in. it. We, we don't have time to go into all that either. But it absolutely destroyed Cain's confidence when God, because out of love, Cain could have taken this differently. Cain could have, could have gone through this and grown from this, but he didn't. He didn't get what he liked. He didn't get what he wanted. He didn't get the approval he thought he deserved, so he got angry. He got angry at God, but he also got angry at his brother. And he said, and they talked. I wonder what kind of conversation that was. I wonder if it was one conversation or ten. I wonder if it was a, one of those things that fester. You know, it, it kind of grows. To the point that one day, as they were out in the field, Cain had enough, and his anger grew to the place that he struck down his brother and killed his brother. We don't know how the news got back to Adam and Eve. Maybe Cain went home. Where's your brother? We know God met him. God had a conversation with Cain. And even there we see the defiance of the oldest brother. Am I my brother's keeper? Projecting it out. It's not my fault. It's their fault. It's not my fault, God. It's your fault. Why is life so unfair? But sooner or later, the word got out. Sooner or later, the body was found. And we see broken relationships. Broken relationships here. So, let me talk about Eve for here just a moment. Do you think she felt responsible for her children's missteps? Do not raise your hands, do not answer. Moms, how often when your children do something wrong, do you feel like it's your fault? Of course, some of y'all have perfect kids. Come talk to me and I'll tell you it is your fault. No, I'm just kidding. 
Here in this situation, you think she thought back to the garden when everything was good and right and perfect? Now, she had that first step of broken relationship with God, had to be mended. Now, her children will go through it. There's one thing I love about moms, and that's love. Me and y'all missed it. That would have been a great amen moment. Let me try it again. There's one thing I love about moms, and that is love. I mean, it's not as powerful when I have to prompt you, but at least you got it through, right? But what do you do with loss? What do you do with brokenness? What do you do in those circumstances? You see, I think you need to lead by love. I think you need to lead by grace. Many times, our kids don't need another lecture. They just need more love. And let me remind you what grace is. Grace is what you receive that you do not deserve. And moms, praise God for grace. Rather than just pouring out more brokenness, moms can be the completer of grace. They can be the instrument of God's love to help build back when things are broken. It doesn't have to be over. Greater things can come. Also, I know Cain probably looked up to his dad quite a bit. And Eve probably, by how she honored her husband, she taught her kids to honor. But yet, what do you do when they don't honor? You love. You love. Now, that may sound like a very simple statement. It is a simple statement. But I've seen enough of the other. I've seen enough of the effects of the other. And we need to just say, this may be hard. This may be difficult. But this is what we... This is the greatest thing that we could do. In Proverbs 10, verse 12, it says, Love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers. There can be all kinds of brokenness, but love is the thing that comes in and bring, brings those things back together. And if, I, if we need anything in this world, it's more love. As I began the service, I said, patient, long-suffering, and kind. But number two, Eve knew about broken relationships, but she also understood loss. Loss. It should never be that the parent has to bury the child. But how difficult that day must have been. From dirt we came to dirt we shall return. To dig the hole. To lay it there. I wonder how many times Scripture doesn't tell us Eve passed that way. I wonder how many days she went by the grave. I wonder how she had to fight having a broken countenance by, by loss. Like I said before, I wonder how many times she blamed herself. How many times she said she was the one who was responsible. And I want to say it this way. Loss of good. Loss of good. Abel. The first one in Hebrews chapter 11, the great chapter of faith, the very first one mentioned was Abel. And I wonder how much time Eve was there saying, why did it have to be this way? And Eve understood loss, difficulty, hardship, pain. Satan always, I know y'all are going to get tired of hearing me say this, but you're going to have to because I'm going to say it over and over and over again. Satan always is out to divide and conquer. It's what he did in the Garden of Eden to, to separate them from God and even put in the seed of separating Adam from Eve. 
when they were supposed to be one flesh. Satan always attacks relationships. Don't think that when they were growing up that Cain and Abel weren't probably best friends at one time. Playmates, doing things together. But yet Satan can come in and, and, and divide where God wants to bring together and where God will say, listen, where God will say nothing can separate. Satan will say, yes, there can be something that separates. And in our world today, some people, out of almost a feeling of righteousness, want to separate and and cast stones and strain at a gnat. And they want to to major on the splinter. They're the splinter, taking splinters out of somebody else's eye when they've got a log in their own. They want to be the Pharisee that wants to trip somebody up and and find some fault within them and divide and conquer and and be the judge and the jury. But I don't have that right and you don't have that right. And I don't think Eve wanted that right. In the very first family, there was broken relationships and loss. So why should we ever think that in our families, we won't go through the same thing. Where parents take that on and feel responsible. Can I, I just want to pause here for a moment and, and just take a little side note. I, I hope it's not chasing a rabbit. But, but moms... I think that you understand that your job is to nurture and to love and, and, and to build up. But can I, for all those who are in the building, maybe, but for those that are watching online, please listen to this. I think one of the greatest responsibilities before God as a mom is to see your children, how God made them, and how God gave them spiritual gifts And your responsibility is not to let those kids follow in your footsteps, but you're to nurture those spiritual gifts in your children. Find them. Nurture them. Build them up. Encourage them. They are gifted of God. They have strengths that it will be their privilege to walk the days of life in right relationship with God, using those attributes and those gifts, those spiritual gifts, for His kingdom's work and for the good of all that are around them. One thing I found when I'm like every kid, when you get to a certain age, you start thinking about what you're going to do when you grow up. And some of those things are absolutely ridiculous. I mean, there can only be so many astronauts. Amen? But I was seven years old when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. But there's only so many astronauts, right? There's only so many things that you can think. And, and uh, I couldn't play in the NBA or the NFL or Major League Baseball. You know what? I, I ain't that good. So you, some of those dreams you have to put aside. And I wasn't looking to be a pastor. I wasn't looking for those things. But I can look back on it now with hindsight and see how my mom understood that there was something that God had his hand on in my life and my mom with a great wonderful touch began to develop some of those things never telling me hey Brian one day you're gonna be a preacher because you know me I'd have done just the opposite amen but she she took on those things And I understand that, please bear with me, spiritual gifts done in the strength of man is vile. And it can rub you the wrong direction, and you can get tired and weary of it. But just understand, you're waiting for the day, you're nurturing for the day, that the Holy Spirit empowers it. As John the Baptist said, He must increase, I must decrease. And as we find that, and as we nurture that, and as we grow that, and as we 
allow the Holy Spirit to do in our lives what only He can do. Magic can happen. Amazing things can happen. Eternal differences can happen. People can feel fulfilled. People can feel like they have a purpose and meaning in their life. And one of the things that absolutely is astounding me, and I'll say it as boldly as I can, as parents today care more for their children to to be great students or or great athletes or, or great in the arts, and they put all of their time and attention to that, and they overlook the things that really matter, and that's the spiritual gifts that God has placed within them that need to be developed. I cannot say that more forcefully. And grandparents, don't you buy into the lie either. Those other things will pass away. It doesn't matter how many goals I scored or how many home runs I hit or how many touchdowns I scored. Those things, I guarantee you, there's a time then that will pass away. They don't have too many leagues for 58-year-old baseball players. Amen? Amen? But there are some things that you invest in that God will honor forever and ever for eternity and infinity beyond. So, gosh, I guess I took that one point and went a long way with it, didn't I? So let me just talk about my third point, doors of opportunity. There were broken relationships and there was loss, but there was also a door of opportunity. Cain, broken, off on his own. Abel, dead with God. But God gave her Seth, another child. And the Bible says she had many sons and daughters. So after Seth, I don't know, maybe Mark, right? Maybe there was a Broadus in there or a Ron. Right? There was a Katie in there, a Susan, a Jane, all of those things along the, a Nevaeh, all those things along the line. Life's not just about brokenness. Listen, family's not just about loss. There are opportunities that come. And Eve got the blessing of not only being mom, but grandmom. And great grandma, and great great grandma. And I don't think anybody in here is going to get there, but great 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 grandma, and great 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 grandma. And I'm sure that there were days that she would walk by the grave where Abel was buried. But I'm sure that there were days that she walked down to the grandkids' house to play with them in the great-grandkids' place and play with them. New opportunities to be who God created you to be. New love. I remember very well when my kids were small and they would run. I, my dad never told me he loved me until I was 40 years old. I made it a promise to my wife and to God that every day my kids grew up, I would tell them I loved them. I, wanted it, I didn't want there to be a day that gone by that they didn't get a hug from their dad. And I bless the Lord for that. My kids aren't perfect, not at all, except Jody, she's here. She's perfect. But last weekend, my granddaughter was at the house, and... Uh, I was in my lazy boy recliner. Amen, hallelujah, praise God. And she came around the side of that, and she crawled up on the arm of that lazy boy recliner, and she put her arms around Pop's neck, and she gave me a hug. By the way, Lynn was taking a picture when this happened. I got it on my phone. I may put it in my office. And those feelings that I had when my kids were so small came rushing back to me. And it it was okay for the... 28 and the 30 year old dad, the 32, 34 year old dad to, to have those feelings. But you know, it feels pretty good when 58 year old Pops gets to have those feelings too. New opportunities to pour into another. Another day. Every day that this 
good old sun comes around and we rotate around that, that sun, you know what? Every day is a new opportunity. Every day I can put yesterday behind. I can feel grace, the Son of God, on my face. I can put the loss and the mistakes and, and the, the, the pride and, and the failure of yesterday behind, and I can live this day the best I can under the Lord. And I just want to say to all the moms that are out there, God's giving you another day of love. God's giving you another day to, to pour into your children, to make a memory, something that will last, something that will honor. There's some things my mom did for me that I'll never forget. She prayed for me. She was, she spent time with me. My dad was too busy. He was a successful man. He was a businessman and a pastor. And, and I was, I, grew, I understand it wasn't his fault to a certain degree because I, I grew up in the time of his life. That time, he was, he was uh, 41 when I was born. He was in his productive years, those years that, that he was doing for others. And the phone would call and he'd have to go spend building up someone else's family. He never watched me play ball. He never did all those things. But, but mom did. And mom was there. And, and she spent time with me, and she prayed for me, and she encouraged me. And she set an example of, of, of tenderness. But she also set an example of, of, of punishment to me, too. Now, don't get it wrong. She didn't just give me tenderness. I mean, one time she took a science book and hit me upside the head with it. <laughs> and I only feel safe saying that because she's in heaven. Amen? Amen? And, and I'm not saying I didn't. Well, in that particular case, I didn't deserve it, but... Uh, um, and those, those are just the things of life that come. Those opportunities. My mom was there for me. I can't change the past, but I can change the future. Moms, we need you. We need more of a mom's love than we need a dad's correction. There's a lot of things that are going on in this world today that I just don't understand. And I guess it's going to be that way because sin is going to reign temporarily until Jesus comes back and takes over. But moms and grandmothers, and for you, some may be great-grandmothers, we need more of a mom's love in this world because love covers a multitude of sins. Let's pray. My Father, my God, Jesus, my Savior, my Lord, Holy Spirit, my encourager, my confidant, my corrector, I want to thank you for moms we gather together to celebrate moms today. Lord, there's nothing as beautiful as when your people, rightly related to you, are serving each other in the light of your love. We need more of that today. I pray for the young moms. I pray for the older moms who would pour their life into the younger moms. We need some of those Titus II women to come alongside them. And Lord, the world's broken. That's not news to you, but we confess it to you. And Lord, we confess that you're a great God and we can't do. We can't fix this world, Lord. But Lord, let us leave with your love. Let us not be angry and our countenance fallen because we're not getting things our way. But Lord, may we be a pattern that this world will find attractive. Lord, we understand that we're to be disciples. But Lord, let us be disciples in our own home. Let it begin there. Father, we chase the riches of this world, but may we find the riches that are even in our own homes. Give us eyes to see, Jesus. Eyes to see our children the way you see them. The value that is there. 
maybe the untapped potential. Lord, I pray that you'll do an ex Ephesians 3.20 work in our children. I pray, Lord, that you will bless the children's program of this church and the kids as we will seek to be your hands and your feet and, and pour into them. And Lord, uh, can I just say I love you? I thank you for being a God of restoration, of reconciliation, a God that believes that family first, Lord, and everything else second. Father, help us build godly homes. And Lord, for the moms that are here today, some of them need to put the past in the past and, and, and let go of the shame that they feel and the responsibility for things that are not their own. And Lord, bless the helicopter moms that they would let you be God and not try to be God of their children. And Lord, just to, 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 we can teach our kids the, right, the way to go. So Lord, let us be encouraged today. And Father, if there's anyone listening that feels the unbrokenness or the brokenness of this world and wants to have a new day of being united with you, that needs to trust you, Jesus Christ, as Savior and Lord. Father, may they repent of their sins and believe in you and ask you to do for them what only you can do, to take away their sins and come into their heart and save them. Father, just a prayer away. May they find the wisdom in doing that, even doing that right now as you lead. Father, may we reflect in this next moment, and may we be obedient to you in this next moment. Lord, you can do more in a moment than I can do in a lifetime. And I ask that you do that even now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.